One thing to know about me is that I take the role of recommending people the perfect book for them very, very seriously. Maybe too seriously, but this is genuinely the one thing I think I'm actually kind of good at. And I've been making these videos for a while now where I head to Instagram and I ask you guys what kind of book you are looking for, like your most oddly specific request. And then I go through the kind of like library of books in my brain and recommend you the perfect book for you. However, I've never done this before with my actual collection of books displayed like this. So this time, instead of just rummaging through in my brain, we can quite literally rummage through my collection of books to find you the book that hopefully will make you fall back in love with reading, get you out of a reading slump, find your next favorite book, or honestly, just impress people who see you reading on public transport who think you're cool and mysterious, you know? We've got range. <laughs> we can do it all. So as always, I asked you guys over on Instagram. This is my username, at Jack Ben Edwards, if you want to make sure that you make it to the next one. I asked you what you wanted to read. Overwhelmingly, so many people said Saltburn Vibes. I mean, this book is basically the source material for Saltburn. This is Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn War. It's about a guy called Charles who meets someone called Sebastian at university at Oxford. And he just becomes infatuated with Sebastian and his family and the rapidly disappearing world of privilege that they inhabit. Habit. Instead of being set in the 2007 murder on the dance floor era that Saltburn is, Brideshead Revisited is set in a kind of golden age just before the Second World War. Emerald Fennell has spoken about how this was a huge inspiration behind Saltburn. Also, if you're interested in the idea of identity and performance, we also have The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is about a guy who wants money, who wants success, who wants the good life so badly that he is willing to to kill for it. It's about identity theft, it's queer, it's a really well-paced thriller, it's cool, it's swift, it's shocking, it's amoral, this character is crazy, he's insane, and he ends up on the run, and so this is a real page turner. There's a great adaptation of the book as well, and I think Netflix are currently making another one, which is starring Andrew Scott, and I think it's gonna be really, really good, so we'll see. You could hang every paragraph of this book in the Louvre. Okay, I have Something immediately comes to mind. Clarice Lispector's Agua Viva. Clarice Lispector is this Brazilian writer, and in her books, not a word is wasted. Every sentence is so carefully crafted, so meticulously made. She was a really important 20th century writer. This book is very direct, confessional. It feels like a meditation on love and life and time and sleep. It is absolutely magical. A book for someone who loves to eavesdrop on strangers' conversations and then gossip about them. Okay, so there's this book called Big Swiss. It's by Jen Began. And in Big Swiss, we follow a sex therapist's assistant. Her job is basically to transcribe the interviews of the sex therapist and she ends up just becoming absolutely infatuated with one of his clients. What she does is supposed to be confidential but she just becomes so obsessed with this person that when she then bumps into this person, she befriends her and pretends that she has absolutely no idea who she is. And so it's all about that complete invasion of privacy, a really, really fascinating character dynamic, and it's kind of insane. There's a theme here that a lot of these books are about insane characters, but this is one for the gossip lovers. Going through your first heartbreak while stuck on a 20 hour train journey. Firstly, I hope you're okay. That sounds like hell. You are really in the trenches here. I, I've, I've got a book for you. Firstly, this one, this is I'm a Fan. It's by Sheila Patel. It's about being with someone who is not good for you. The narrator is utterly obsessed with her lover, but he loves someone else. And so she also becomes obsessed with the other person he's in love with. It's about how someone can withhold the thing from you that you really, really want. It's brutal. It cuts deep. I think this is really good for like that catharsis, that purge of emotions that you need when you're going through a breakup of just being like, this person is horrible for me and yet I love them. And I'm so stressed and annoyed at myself and it's making me do insane, crazy things. I'm not myself when I'm in this situation. So I'm a fan is good fun and outrageous that this is a debut novel. But then also, if you want something a little bit more comforting, maybe, this book, Less, is about someone who gets an invite to his ex's wedding. And this just triggers this whole crisis in him, and he decides to take every opportunity that he has in his email inbox, because he's a writer, so there are lots of opportunities all around the world to share his work, do residencies, that kind of thing, and so he goes on this trip around the world, and if you're on a train, I feel like maybe that will be nice to think about the opportunities of exploring, and that wanderlust maybe you're feeling, but my favourite thing about this book is when he talks about the nature of breakups and relationships ending. It's by Andrew Sean Greer, and the metaphor that he uses for leaving a relationship is moving house. He talks about how just because you've moved out of a house or 
left a relationship, it doesn't mean that that house or that relationship weren't good and that they didn't serve you at the time. It just means that you've outgrown it and it's time to move on and it's time to seek someone new that now fits your needs. It doesn't mean it was a bad house or that you didn't enjoy living there while you did, it's just that it's time to move on. And I really like that idea of thinking about past relationships as somewhere you used to live but you don't live anymore. And for me, I found a lot of reassurance in that in terms of not feeling resentment, not feeling regret, feeling grateful that a thing happened, but understanding that it's time to move somewhere nicer and bigger and better. And I think this book captures that essence very, very well. Someone said, I just really love my dog. <laughs> and I don't know if you're asking for a book recommendation or just telling me that, but I do have this collection of poetry from Mary Oliver. This is called Dog Songs. Mary Oliver is a really wonderful poet who talks about how nature is our best teacher, how we can appreciate the little things in life and make the most of every day, spend time in the environment around us, and one of the things she consistently talks about is her dog Percy. This is a collection of poems about that dog and other various dogs that she had in her life. One of my favourite quotes is from a poem called Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night, and she talks about how her dog rolling onto its back and opening up its belly to be rubbed is almost like the dog asking to be told that it is loved through an action. She says, could there be a sweeter arrangement? Over and over, he gets to ask, I get to tell. And if you just really love your dog or you have a friend who really loves their dog, this is the perfect book for you or them to read. Books about the craft of writing. I've been waiting for this one. Elena Ferrante in the margins, the writer of My Brilliant Friend. We also have Deborah Levy with this book, Things I Don't Want to Know. I mean, the goat that is Joan Didion. Let me tell you what I mean. She has this one essay in here called Why I Write. And I love the way Joan Didion talks about writing. She says writing is a hostile act because no one wants to hear about other people's dreams or nightmares. It's the most boring thing anyone can ever tell you about. And she says writing is exactly that. It's asking people to listen to your dream. In the act of asking someone to listen to you. And um, the essay Why I Write is a response to George Orwell's essay of the same name. She says, I, 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 in many ways, writing is the act of saying I, of imposing oneself upon other people, of saying, listen to me, see it my way, change your mind. It's an aggressive, even a hostile act. There you go. I just think Dona is one of the best writers to have ever existed. Oh, there's also this one, A Horse at Night on Writing. This is by Amina Kane, who also wrote the book Indelicacy. She's a really wonderful writer. In this book, she responds to a lot of the literary greats, kind of a manifesto for writing and a conversation with those that came before her, which I think is really interesting. There's also On Writing by Charles Bukowski, which is a collection of his letters where he addresses the concept of writing and the craft. And then also On Writing by Stephen King. Again, just a legend of writing fiction and getting his insights is incredible. Oh, and there's also this one, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain by George Saunders, in which four Russians give a masterclass on writing, reading, and life. So kind of learning from the best. A book that would impress Hosier. <sighs> okay, so Hosier has a lot of biblical, literary references, a real reverence of nature, and okay, I've got it. We have Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This is actually a reimagination of what it would have been like for Shakespeare's family, but it never mentions Shakespeare by name. So it recenters Shakespeare's wife and his children, who often are left out of the narrative when we talk about Shakespeare. His son was called Hamnet, he died really young, he actually inspired the play Hamlet, but this book is so moving, so breathtaking, the imagery is stunning, just totally mesmerizing. His wife is really interested in like medicine and herbs. It's devastating, it's about yearning and grief and loss, and I feel like Hosier would appreciate this one. Which is high praise indeed for someone who wrote, when my time comes around, lay me gently in the cold dark earth, no grave could hold my body down, I'll crawl home to her. Anyway. <laughs> A book set in the forest or at sea. I can do both. I think I can do both for you in one book. From my mythology collection, this is Atalanta. It's a book by Jennifer Saint, who is kind of creating this canon of female mythology, turning our attention, turning our focus back to the women of Greek and Roman mythology. And so this is the story of Atalanta, who grows up in the forest. She's raised by bears, blessed by a goddess, and then sent out with Jason and the Argonauts. And she was the female warrior alongside the Argonauts. So you have her time in the woods, kind of learning her craft, and then her time applying that craft when she is out at sea with the Argonauts. So I think Honestly, I kind of nailed that one, <laughs> I have to say. A book that will make me want to go away and do loads of research. Huh. I think that the book that 
had the biggest response like this for me is right here. It's called In Cold Blood. It's by Truman Capote, who also wrote Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's set in the 50s in Kansas, and it's basically about this family who were found brutally murdered, and two guys were accused of breaking into their house and murdering the family. And this book is Truman Capote's retelling of those events, but he actually interviewed the suspects in the case, and it's really interesting because he formed a really close relationship with one of them, so it's kind of questionable whether he forged that relationship with someone on death row purely in order to get stuff out of him for this book, or because he genuinely thought that guy was innocent. So if true crime kind of fascinates you, or just humanity in general, or the lack of humanity, I think that this is a really interesting thing to go away and research, both the actual case that did happen and also Truman Capote's questionable relationship and proximity to it. So much to unpack with this book, both in terms of the story it's telling and the way the story is told and how the story was researched and investigated and how much he was swayed by his personal relationship to these people. Oh, okay, this person wants recommendations of banned books. I have a bunch for you. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison is absolutely harrowing and intense and devastating. It's about a poor black family and the daughter of that family prays every night to have the bluest eyes. She prays that her eyes would be lighter, that she would look more like her white companions at school who she deems to be more beautiful and lovely and who are more privileged than her. It's intimate, it's unsparing, it's incredibly graphic and, you know, horrible at times. But I think Toni Morrison completely reshaped literature and the reason this was banned I think is because it kind of holds up a mirror to America and says this is the culture we have created. And a lot of people did not like that, so this has been banned totally unjustly. This is an amazing, amazing book. There's also this one. Um, this is All Boys Aren't Blue. It's by George M. Johnson. It's a memoir manifesto about growing up black and queer. It's about being bullied. It's about toxic masculinity. It's about gender dysphoria and euphoria. It's about inequality, consent. It's about black joy. And again, weirdo conservatives in America have tried to ban this book, and so we have to resist that by reading it, by championing it, by talking about it. Someone said, I'm looking for a book for the recovering horse girlies. Okay, I actually just read something that I think you might really like. It's this book here, it's called Kick the Latch, and it's by Catherine Scanlan. It is about this woman who was a horse trainer, and the author actually did a series of interviews with a real life horse trainer who is the kind of basis of this book. She is the source material, and then this is a really punchy, kind of supercut of a life, where we see her all the way from childhood to the end of her career, and she talks about her love for horses, and then she enters the world, which is often brutal, of jockeys, of horse training, of horse racing, but this book just absolutely oozes with personality and character, it's so good, and horses are very much in every scene. So, a book for a dancer who wants to pursue it as her career, but is burdened to pick a respectful job. Okay, well, I'm, firstly, I'm rooting for you. Secondly, I have this book by Meg Howery, which is called They're Going to Love You. It's about a girl who is a ballet dancer and she moves to Greenwich Village to stay with her dad and his new partner. So it's about art and like their relationship, father-daughter relationships, but also the relationship of this couple. And something happens that summer when she's visiting them, which causes her to become estranged from that side of her family. And then years and years later, when she is an adult woman, she revisits that couple, that home, when things have changed quite significantly. Can you tell? I'm trying not to give any spoilers here. But it's about how her young self informed the woman that she becomes, but also about the expression of art and dancing, and it's, yeah, a really wonderful book. A modern classic that will keep me engaged. Okay, I think what you're looking for is The Virgin Suicides. This is about these five sisters who one by one commit suicide over the course of one year. So it's about this kind of fatal, melancholy that the girls experience, it's about the family in the wake of these deaths, it's about adolescence, it's, there's also a mystery to these girls and why they behave in the way that they do, it's just a really really captivating book and it definitely keeps you on your toes, also you kind of know that there are more deaths coming so you kind of can't look away from it. Super lyrical, super morbid and I recommend thoroughly. Okay, this one says, I need to get a gift for my boyfriend on Valentine's Day, I want to show him my appreciation with a book, he mostly reads short contemporary literature from Japan. This is my area of expertise, I've got this. I have a whole shelf of this. We obviously need some Haruki Murakami. I'm gonna go with Sputnik's sweetheart. I mean, he's like the, a legend. Murakami's writing feels like poetry. All of his books have this kind of film 
over them that just makes these books so so special to read but then also i would recommend the works of osamu desai firstly no longer human but then this is the kind of follow-up to that book this is the flowers of buffoonery osamu desai was a very very troubled person and his books kind of delve into the dark corners of human consciousness they're very nihilistic and existential and he did not want to be on this earth anymore really so this book is set in a kind of seaside sanatorium but it's written in such a sharp way really really interesting a book that will make you appreciate your mum oh this is going to be the hero of this book this is by elizabeth mccracken it's called the hero of this book and the hero that she speaks about is her mum and it's just this really lovely elegy and memoir about her mother which also contemplates other things about human existence and life and belonging and family but it really centers her mother who she just brings to life on the page it feels like a really honest fair, funny and tender, but also heartbreaking and philosophical observation about one person and it kind of uses the character of her mother to observe life in general. And I think it definitely does just make you appreciate your mum. I love music, traveling, appreciating the little things. Okay. August Blue, I think, is the book for you. This is by Deborah Levy. It's about a retired piano player. What's the right word? Pianist. There you go. She had this mentor who kind of took her under his wing and then she did this one performance and totally messed it up. And that just put her off playing piano professionally, but she's now returned to teaching piano. And it's said during COVID, she is traveling around Greek islands teaching kids how to play piano. And then she sees this uncannily familiar woman buying these kind of toy horses and she kind of becomes weirdly obsessed with this woman who seems to be her double and it becomes a really interesting analogy metaphor for the lives we could have lived for how we could be different if we'd taken different paths and I love the way that this kind of just floats around Europe to different places and is really gorgeously written. Now before I move on to the next book recommendation I just wanted to let you know that today's video is very very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one place for building a website or an online brand and they have hundreds of incredible templates so you don't need any coding experience, you don't need to be a web design expert, instead you can pick a template and then customize it, make it completely your own and bring your vision to life. They also have loads of incredible features, there's an email sign up, you can make a blog so you can keep people up to date with what you're doing behind the scenes and there are also great analytical tools so you can see what your audience is responding well to and therefore what you should make more of. Squarespace is something that I always 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 recommend and if you would like to give it a go you can actually get a free trial over at squarespace.com and then when you're ready to launch your beautiful new website or online brand you can head to squarespace.com slash Jack Edwards and use the code Jack Edwards to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So thank you so so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Something that will make me giggle. Okay, this has got to be anxious people. It kind of, this book wins the Goofy Award for like the most unserious book that is also incredibly moving. It's about a hostage situation at an apartment viewing. So you basically have this really interesting microcosm of society of people of all different ages and professions, people with different relationships to one another. And they are in this really strange situation and they end up kind of having all these conversations, learning about one another in a way that kind of is similar to The Breakfast Club, where the setting is just one room, but you learn so much about each of these characters' lives and their mentalities and their mindsets and their troubles and their problems. And they warm to one another in this predicament that they're in. Frederick Blackman's writing is always very witty and silly. It's like I said, it's just goofy. Sometimes the humor is a little bit cheesy, but it will bring a smile to your face. It's an easy read, a page turner, and it's a lighthearted one, even though it has really deep and profound moments as well. And I think that the lightheartedness mixed with the profound moments, having those two things juxtaposition together actually increases the intensity of both. So yeah, I really recommend this book. Something that feels like food prepared by grandma on a sunny winter afternoon. Okay, so we want like a heartwarming book. I think for me, it's got to be Days at the Morisaki Bookshop. This is about a woman who goes to stay with her uncle who owns a bookshop, living in his spare room, surrounded by books. And there's this one really amazing quote that I love, which I hope I'm gonna be able to find. Okay, so she says, I don't know. I think maybe I've been wasting my time just doing nothing. And her uncle replies, I don't think so. It's important to stand still sometimes. Think of it as a little rest in the long journey of your life. This is your harbour, and your boat is just dropping anchor here for a little while, and after you're well rested, 
you can set sail again. Just such a comfort read, it feels like a hug in a book. It's about family, it's about new beginnings, and this is a comfort read for sure. And translated from Japanese, so this could actually hit multiple of these requests. Book Rex for girls that never recovered from The Hunger Games. I have the exact thing for you. So, The Hunger Games is a kind of teen dystopia, but probably the most famous dystopian novel of all time is 1984 by George Orwell. Well, this book is a new adaptation, it's a new retelling of 1984, but told from the perspective of Julia, who in 1984 is Winston's love interest. And in 1984 she's a little bit, not one-dimensional, but there are lots of questions I left that book with, you know. She's a badass, she goes to all these black markets to procure supplies and things that she needs, and Winston kind of is a bit dismissive of her, like he never really inquires too deeply into why she's doing all of that, or I should say how she's doing all of that, you know. And anyway, this book seeks to unpack that. So it's a female-led dystopia, and I think if you never recovered from The Hunger Games, this could be up your street. A sapphic story where the couple's main problem isn't homophobia, and the book feels rainy and foggy. All right, if only I could find the book that I'm thinking of. Oh my god, here it is. This is Boulder by Eva Baltazar. It's about a woman who works as a cook on a boat, and then one time when the boat kind of goes to shore, she gets off, she meets this woman, has an intense love affair with this woman, and then she's like, I have to get back on the boat now. So she says, wait for me, I'll be back in three months, I'll see you then. And three months pass, and they meet up again. The woman that she fell in love with says to her, I'm actually moving to Iceland. And so our main character says, okay, fine, I'll come with you. They go to Iceland, they get settled, and her partner says to her, oh, and also I want to have a kid. And I want to have a kid, literally right now, because I'm aging, I, I want to make sure I have my child immediately. And so our main character, whose nickname is Boulder, that's why the book is called Boulder, she kind of goes along with it, even though it's not something she actually really wants. And it's just such a fascinating insight into motherhood, into a relationship, into yearning for both love and freedom simultaneously. Every line is exquisite and beautiful, like the writing is stunning, but yeah, something a little bit different. And then also, the other one that springs to mind is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This is about two women. One has been on a submarine, she's like a marine biologist, and the submarine had an incident where it submerged all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and they couldn't get back up. So she was stranded on this submarine for like an ungodly amount of time, and so we flip between her POV when she was on the submarine, and then a year later, her wife's perspective when she is kind of nursing her back to health and she just doesn't recognize the woman that she originally fell in love with, like she is a shell of herself. And so it's about PTSD, it's about the water, it's about love enduring when you don't even recognize the person that you originally fell in love with. And again, it is so lyrically and poetically written, these books are God tier. Okay, let's do one more. A book where a cat is the narrator or main character. Okay, we did a dog one, so let's do a cat one. I'm looking straight up to my Japanese fiction because almost all of them feature cats. Specifically, a lot of them have cats on the cover, but this one is the one that is springing to mind. This is She and Her Cat, and it's all about the different cats in this one neighborhood and the way that they perceive their owners who are all going through a myriad of crises and mental health issues, and the cats are kind of just there for them, and we see these characters through the eyes of their pets. So, those are all of my recommendations. I'll do another video just like this, because honestly, I had a lot of fun. So make sure you are following me on Instagram so that you are the first to see when I next ask for your very specific book requests. In the meantime, I post all of my reviews here on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Goodreads, on the Storygraph. Anywhere you need a book recommendation, I will be there. <laughs> it's, it's, my job is just book. Thank you for watching this video, I hope that you found a book that you would love to read and enjoy, I guess. Thanks so much for watching, all the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you very, very soon. Bye bye